Hey, you are listening to the Grumpy Guy BJJ Podcast. Hey, what's up, guys? Got to take care of a few things before we jump into this week's episode. First, our Ramping Isometrics for BJJ program. It is a 12-week program all laid out for you. It's going to help you build strength and cardio in the fastest, safest, and most convenient way possible. This is how James and I have been training for the past year, and we love it. So we put this program together so you can just follow along, and we are certain you will see and feel the benefits that we do. It's only 15 bucks. Just go to grumpyguybjj.com, click the drop-down menu in the upper right-hand corner, and you'll find it. Next, R3. Is, this is our K2-D3 supplement. It is a combination, combination of those two vitamins, D3 and K2. These are two vitamins that James and I have been taking for a long time that really help us recover from hard training sessions. And for only 15 bucks with free shipping, you get a whole month's supply. I was going to pull up some studies explaining the benefits of D3 and K2, but I'm not going to insult your intelligence and pretend to be a fucking scientist. I take it. It helps me recover. That's it. So for 15 bucks, check it out. And last, but certainly not least, we have partnered up with Dejitsu.com. They have a ton of awesome BJJ instructionals, and they have hooked us up with a discount code for our listeners. It's Grumpy10. So what you got to do is you go to Dejitsu.com, which is D-I-G-I-T-S-U.com. Find the instructionals you want, throw them in a shopping cart, in the little discount code box, you type in Grumpy10, which is just G-R-U-M-P-Y, and the number 10. One zero. That's it. No spaces. Boom. You get 10% off. You're up and running. They got a nice app you can download on your phone. That way you can take your instructionals right to the gym with you. Watch the technique. Drill it. It's a pretty sweet setup. So once again, D-I-G-I-T-S-U dot com. Discount code Grumpy10, G-R-U-M-P-Y-1-0. Simple as that. To find all this stuff I just got done talking about, go to our website, GrumpyGuyBJJ.com. Click the drop-down menu in the upper right-hand corner. There, you'll subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates. You'll find links for the Ramping ISOs program, the R3 Recovery Supplement, and then under the Programs and Products tab, you'll find a link to Dejitsu.com. And let's be honest, if you guys can't figure out how to navigate a website by now, there's nothing I can do to help you. So quit fucking around, check it out, train hard, and let's get into this week's episode. Okay, back again. Back once again. Yes. More on a normal routine. Was it last week we were recording? Uh, Thursday. Yeah, fucked up day. Yeah, because you went to the uh, right. seminar. I was leaving that That's night. Weekend, yeah. That was a long fucking day, man. I didn't yeah. get out of town till like 7 o'clock. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't roll into Salt Lake till like 11. So I think I found a Taco Bell that was open around. Did, did you really eat Taco Bell? Dude, I had some Taco Bell. Out of Did all the really? fast food uh, restaurants, Taco Bell is about the only one that I can take. So, did you get a couple steaks off tacos? It's not terrible. Man, that doesn't even enter like my thought process. Like, I would not fucking. I would either fast or I'd go buy some trail mix from the gas station. <laughs> <laughs> gas station trail mix. Gas station trail mix. Huh? What do you got against Taco Bell? Um. Everything. Just is it Taco Bell or just fast food? Pretty much. Right? I mean, not fast all fast food, food but you're you're. Staple. What do you mean, not all fast food? Like I'll eat like uh, you like Jimmy John's once in a while. Yeah. Qdoba, Chipotle. I'll eat some of those sometimes. Okay. So I'm not 100 percent anti fast food, but for the most part, yeah. So like if, like McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, yeah. well, Wendy's. What if you like found that? out like Chipotle gets their steak from the same place? I would like, ignore it. Taco Bell does. It's fake news. It is fake news. Fake they news. probably don't, but... I'd call it fake news. I think Chipotle, like, raises their own animals, according to their... Not really, but... <laughs> according <laughs> to their fucking PR, man, you know? They're, like, all about the happiest animals. Chipotle is? Yeah. You know, it's all that responsible consumership bullshit. Trying to make you feel better about your choices by them paying attention to their choices. I could see that. Yeah. You see that a bunch. Yeah. So. I remember like when Chipotle was like new and big. I remember one of my first trips out to Colorado back in like, oh man, it would have been 97 or something, 98. 
and I uh, stayed with a buddy's cousin in Denver, and he was stoked. He's like, man, there's this burrito place down the road for me. Get these fucking giant burritos. Giant burritos. And I was like, well, you know, we didn't believe him. He's like, oh, no, these fucking burritos are serious. And to Chipotle it went. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, if it was true, those are some giant fucking burritos. Big old burritos, they're good. I remember, I lived in Santa Barbara. They had one of those Mexican markets around the corner. Super Cucus. And, uh, man, <laughs> super Cucus? <laughs> super Cucus. Yeah, anyways. Um, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but that's how it was uh, spelled. Sure. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm getting the super right. Let's <laughs> hope. <laughs> but, uh, man, they had some fucking burritos that were kick-ass. And they were like, same thing, man. Just big-ass burritos. So that was what Chipotle reminded me of when I found that. I was like, oh, these are like super kookus burritos. These are awesome. Of course, then we all got into eating the bowls. The bowls are good. The bowls good. are good, man. Yeah. I like, that's the thing with burritos. Like, there's just, the tortilla can be a bit much sometimes. It is a, it is a lot of tortillas sometimes. The bowls are good, so you can, you can kind of, like, I like going to Cafe Rio on Taco Tuesdays, and you get the big fucking taco salad bowl. Yeah. It's got, so it's got the shell there, so if you want to eat yeah. some of it, man, you don't have to go crazy with it. Yeah. It's pretty goddamn good. Yeah. Then we're going to stop talking about food, or going to get I know. <laughs> I'll get started on food. I know. But, uh, so anyways. Anyways. Here we are. So I finished reading The Epic of Gilgamesh. Okay. Um, last week. Yeah. Or a few days ago anyways. That's a good book. Good story, I good should story, say. Good story, yeah. Yeah, like, I didn't have too many expectations going in, but that's a good fucking story. Then, so it, it prompted me, now I'm reading The Iliad. Good. It's been a long time since I read that. The Iliad, man, mm-hmm. yeah. That's a lot of... That's a big, thick fucking book. It's a up, big book, man. It showed up in my house yesterday. Because <laughs> I, I didn't buy a copy of it, a hard copy, a paperback, but a hard copy of it. It was like five bucks delivered to my house. Yeah. I was like, oh, fuck it. I'll just buy it. It showed up and I opened it up yesterday. I was like, oh, fuck. It's a lot of words. <laughs> it's a lot of words. Went bit off a little bit more than I could chew. Ah. I'm going to plug through it, though. Yeah. Just take it a little bit at a time. Yeah. It's tough to sit down and just plow all the way through because it gets a little... Uh, repetitive yeah but again that was a deal like the thought was this was an oral uh story that they wrote down so they had a lot of this repetitive stuff because it gave the person talking the and the yeah ums yeah and yeah it just gave them a chance to think and put their story together so uh but yeah it's a good it's a fucking good story what's funny is it's not people you're they're like oh yeah we know the story of <clears throat> troy and and uh then you read that and you're like well this is nothing like the goddamn movie nope <laughs> where's Brad Pitt where's Brad Pitt <laughs> Brad Pitt sitting on the sidelines for fucking 95% of the goddamn yeah. thing and uh you never get to the Trojan horse like it just the uh, it ends and you're like what the fuck how's this the, the ending <laughs> yeah how is this the fucking ending yeah the Trojan horse like I, I think I, I had to look into it cause I I read both the Iliad and the Odyssey and neither one of them just neither one of them cover the sacking of Troy. Neither one of them talk about the Trojan horse and exactly what happened, but they, they mention it kind of offhandedly. And I guess there was a couple other references and other stories. So they actually like put the story together. Like there is no story of the Trojan horse, right? There's stories that refer to the story of the Trojan horse. And we've put together the story of the Trojan horse from those references, but there is no story that just this is the Trojan horse story so uh, it's kind of interesting when you think yeah, about it and that's you know, that's kind of a good point to bring up <clears throat> like if you're going to get into reading some of these old books like you got to pay attention to what translation you pick up and read yeah because you will find that some translations uh the author gets very um cocky with his literary interpretation of it right you know so to speak you know gets yeah. real loose with it and starts inserting a lot of shit to make it read better to him or what yeah. he thinks reads better to people yeah so yeah it's i realized that because before i bought my epic of gilgamesh i started recently you know, did a little bit of research about what translation and how pure so you know so to quote unquote yeah you should get you know blah 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 and you do for you come across a lot of bullshit that i you know, at least from what i saw the people just like what you would be reading it would be is so far from what the original text was it's kind of you just get, get the skew it's almost yeah. like watching it's not movie. really a translation right. it's their interpretation right. of the translation so <laughs> what's interesting too is if you read books from different 
eras, translations from different eras. Because people yeah. use different phrases and different words. Uh, you know, um, dude, what's one they throw in in the old ones? Like niggardly. Yeah. Come across that yeah. one yeah. in like some of those old ones. And it's like, you know, you're like, oh yeah. Like there was a time when that was just a word. And it just, people used it all the time. And, and there, yeah, there's a couple where you're just... I don't know. It's, it's funny. It's, you, you sit there and you see that and you do the old like, oh yeah, man, like, dude, what was it like back then when you're just everybody's walking around talking funny like this? So, of course, that didn't sound funny to them, but yeah, that's... Uh, it's interesting. Like, you really try to think about it, you know, and they find all these stone tablets where the shit's scribed into. Yeah. It's like, it's hard <clears throat> to fucking wrap your mind around someone sitting there, you know, just... Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> like, this is a really important story. I got to spend years of my life scribing fucking 1,600 tablets yeah. full of this poem. I don't know if that's how they did it. I don't know. I think that it was like the stone tablets were more like... I don't know if they were stone. Were they stone? Yeah. Or clay? Or clay tablets. I mean, okay. they said... So clay, color. what they would do is they would create the tablets yeah. and then they had like stamps, basically. But still... Yeah. Or somebody sitting there doing it. It's not like just grabbing a bick and a notebook from city market and scribbling down your thoughts no no but yeah it's uh it's an interesting step on the path to it <laughs> <laughs> have you read the epic of gilgamesh i haven't like Dude, i said it's, I, it's I, a good story. I listened to the the uh, myths and legends podcast coverage mm-hmm. of it so i mean i couldn't tell you i don't remember but i, I, I do remember like listening to it and yeah i mean it's a good Good hero's journey, exactly. You know, story. It is the hero's journey, yeah. for sure. So that's uh, that's been good. For some reason, I really dug it though. But yeah, I mean, it's been a long time since I, since I've read an older book like that. Right. And I read, dude, I just I ate it up, man. Like once I started getting into it, like dude, I flew through it. What's well, what? I was like, oh, dude. And then right away, I was like, boom. As soon as I closed the last page, yeah. Then I was like, what's my next old one? Oh, let's do the Iliad. So then I yeah. started researching it and had it ordered. I ordered the Iliad within like ten minutes of you know twenty minutes of finishing, you know, Gilgamesh. Yeah. I was like, all right, we got to go down this path for a little bit. Yeah, we would probably find the same thing. But I mean, I've talked about that before. How the those old stories speak to something uh, in us. And that's one of the reasons that, like, so many stories today, they don't resonate with people because they're more like trying to socially engineer uh, how they want you to act and think through these movies and stories versus how we instinctively know, like, this is this is the way that you should think and act. And so, you know, a story like the Epic of Gil- Gilgamesh, you're like, fuck yeah, man, that really spoke to me. And you're watching some like social justice warrior inspired movie nonsense. <laughs> and you're like, what the fuck is this, man? This is so, this doesn't speak. You know, you're like, this is nonsense. And you can totally tell like when people, they work shit into a story because they're trying to uh, spread a, a, you know, an a opinion, message, a message. Yeah. yeah, versus like just telling the fucking story. So there is a difference, man. It's like... Uh, God, I was thinking about this. Um, I was talking with Shiloh about video games. And there's a difference between a video game becoming addictive and creating a video game to be addictive. And, like, you know, the old Nintendo games were just fucking hard. You know, they didn't make them to be addictive. Like, you got addicted to them because they were fucking hard and, like, certain games, things just... I don't know. I think Tetris was made to be addictive. I don't know if it was made. I, they didn't sit down. I don't think that fucking dude sat down and was like, how, like, like Fortnite was literally designed like, how do we make the most addictive game possible? Yeah. And, you know, they sat down and analyzed all of, and what are the most addictive features? It's like creating a food. Hey, what's all the most addictive features of food? Let's create a food that way. Like that's a totally different way to create something than to create something that ends up becoming addictive. Like Tetris had properties of an addictive game and so you can look at that and say hey if i'm trying to create an addictive game look at tetris and i can model a lot of stuff off of that but i don't think the dude creating that was like specifically you know he's not trying to sell ad space yeah, yeah it's not he's in the guy's social, social media, union yeah it's not the social media error. right you know oh i need more <laughs> eyeballs on the screen you know every time someone clicks here it's right there was, there was none of that yeah yeah so there's a difference in like 
the purpose of why you create something. And so, uh, so anyways, that's, uh, I forget what our, we were talking about originally. Oh, yeah, how the fuck did we start talking about that? But the video game, which is, <laughs> is a good uh, example that popped in my head of people, oh, like putting a message in, like you're, oh, you're, yeah, you're yeah, making yeah, a story, yeah. right? You're making a story, that, if an element is in the story because it's just part of the story, and it ends up being kind of a little bit of a, you know, speaking to a social justice message, then great, you know, but that's different, like, than, uh, like, specifically setting out to create a story to spread that message. And so, same thing with video games, man. Making a fucking good video game that ends up being addictive is different than setting out to create an addictive video game. So. It's different. So your intent, your intent matters, man. What you're setting out to create, the intention behind it, like, it matters. I was trying to figure out, speaking of that, the message... Well, there's many, a lot of messages in Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, but there was one specifically that showed our inclination to like want to start a cult and have sex with everybody's wives. Because Gilgamesh did the same thing. He was the king of the city of Uruk, and he, one of his rules in his kingdom was that he get on the wedding day, he gets to have sex with the bride before the husband does. Right. That was just his rule. Everybody yeah. accepted it. They didn't like it, but I mean, this guy had legs that were nine foot high. He's, he's two thirds yeah. God, you know what I mean? So you can't really argue with him. Braveheart stole that. Remember that shit? So yeah, that was his <laughs> deal, man. Like he gets to have sex with everybody's wife on their wedding day first. Yeah. I was like, man, that's just like a fucking cult. He was kind of basically like <clears throat> one of the world's first known cult leaders. Well, that and it was just like the order back then. It's funny, Ben Shapiro talks about this in that The Right Side of History book that I'm reading. That at one point in time, the world was basically made up of gods, right? That were competing with each other for their own interests. They weren't on the same page. And uh, you had kings who were the chosen ones of gods. And you know, maybe you had some you know, uh, high up people in society that were, uh, had, you know, the God's favor or, or whatever, but everyone else was just like, you're just taking up space. Like, you know, you have a fate and you can't really affect it because there's nothing that you can do. Like these gods, they don't care about you and they're just doing their own thing. And the King is way above you and you're just kind of here for him. That's why he gets to have sex with your wife. Cause <laughs> you're just here for him. Like that just, that fit into that, uh, like that type of um, view of the world, which obviously had a strong religious aspect to it, right? Like I'm assuming that the Epic of Gilgamesh uh, contains gods and yeah, things yeah. like that, right? So, yeah. so there's a lot of those elements where um, you know your your actions don't really matter, and you know these gods are controlling everything, and if they decide that they don't like you or you know then you're fucked. There's nothing you can do. And so that was like the big thing with uh, um, Judaism, like the big break was like, no, there's one God. So that means that there's not multiple gods competing with each other for their own interests. And, and there's different rules and different things going on. And it's basically chaos. There's one God and he's in charge. And so that means that there's some order to what's going on. And, you know, the other big thing was that you are created in the image of God. So it's not just kings. It's not just people up. It's like everyone here matters. And, and so, you know, you have a basic human right because God created you in his own image. And with that comes responsibilities. Like he wants you to act certain ways and, and uh, you know, things like that. But you, you got the freedom. You got the, the, the um basically the the you know your, your your personal rights that a lot of us take for granted today like in gilgamesh's day like those things just didn't fucking exist right if the king says i want to have sex with your wife you had no personal rights under judaism that didn't really there was like no 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 no, no wait a minute that's not right like there's there's you know uh even though he's a, a you know not a king it's like he still has fucking rights right it's not right to do that to him and so these were the big <clears throat> like two of the big thought processes behind the, the Judaism introduced into that world. And again, we all take it for granted, but you know, the human rights, the fact that like you matter, it's not just Kings. Some guy can't come and just have sex with your wife. And like, there is order to the universe. 
right? And like on some level, that's the basis behind science because science is like, hey, I'm going to test something because I assume that there's some sort of order to the universe that I can discern, right? And if I can discern it, then I can predict it and make use of it. And so that's what, you know, you test something and if you get a result and you test it again, you get that same result. Well, you can assume that like, hey, man, this is science is showing that this is uh, that the order behind the universe. This is what it's showing us. So but like, how can there be order to the universe if there isn't like there, there can only be one thing, right? It can't be multiple. It can't be this chaos. It has to be one thing behind it. So uh, so even like the thought of science came from that idea of no there's one order to the universe it's not multiple gods warring with each other like in in that basic assumption you have to be able to make that basic assumption to to start doing science because without that basic assumption why are you going to do science because things can fucking change it does it doesn't matter so but these are those thought processes that you don't, we don't realize. That's the whole point of the book. Like if, if you don't realize what the impact of these thought processes were on societies and what the societies were like that they were introduced to, it's really easy to just discount their, their value and be like, oh, you know, Judeo-Christian bullshit, you know? And it's like, no, man, like the fact that some king can't have sex with your wife, uh, you pretty much kind of owe that to the thought process coming out of Jerusalem back then. So there you go. Yeah. Are you through that book? Did you finish it? No, 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 man. I'm about like uh, a third of the way through it. So I got to. Yeah. Ben Shapiro is an interesting guy. I've heard quite a few interviews with him and whatnot. He's, he's a smart dude. He's a very the, smart dude, The way dude, he thinks, man. the way he thinks about things and then the way he's able to like debate it, so to speak. Yeah, you know, or argue it from a pretty intelligent standpoint. It's I like he's like uh, in my mind, him and Jordan Peterson are probably two of the best at being able to discern the messages from the these old uh, you know traditions and and how they really do apply to us today. <clears throat> and it's like, no man, there is application for this. Like, yeah, you can the way that they're being presented today. Is like, well, you know, uh, Christianity is just obviously, uh, um, you know, white centric. You look at all these, uh, you know, th the wars and all, you know, I mean, you can definitely paint things in a way that makes it negative. But you're, if you don't also look at, well, wait a minute, what were the positives that came with this at all, with this as well, you end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And so I think that's what like Jordan Peterson and, and Ben Shapiro do so well is like, yeah, man, like, yes, there are bad things attached to these things, but a lot of good came from them. And if you just throw it all out because you're going to focus on the bad, like you're going to fuck yeah, us. Yeah, you're going backwards. Yeah, we're going yeah. backwards. We're going back to Gilgamesh's days, basically. <laughs> like, honestly, yeah. like that, that's the direction that that thought process leads you to. So, uh, but anyways. Anyway. So go. I'm trying to better myself reading some of these old texts. It's good, man. It's, it's a good yeah. challenge. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was like surprised, like how much I liked the epic of Gilgamesh, and then just ate it up. Like the last, I had gotten like halfway through it, and yeah, maybe three quarters of the way through or something like that, and then I sat down and was reading. I usually I try to read like 20 minutes in the morning now with my nice floaty schedule that I have, and. uh I read it for 20 minutes and then I, I still had a little bit to go. I was like, fucking, I just kept reading and reading. I ended up spending like an hour just sitting down reading and I finished it. I was like, that's fucking good read. Yeah. You know, it's pretty pumped. Nice, man. Yeah. Well, cool. There's good stuff in there. There is. There is. Yeah, it's good stories. Mm -hmm. I like those things. I mean, as a kid, man, I used to love like the, the Arthur legends and the old Greek uh, myths, the, you know, the hero myths and stuff. I was super into that stuff. See, I never got into it that much as a kid. No. Did you read a lot as a kid? Yeah, yeah, Did I read a lot. I read a lot, yeah. It wasn't like a big thing in my family. You know, I mean, I'd read here and there, you yeah. know, especially when it was suggested strongly through schoolwork that I read right. certain things. But besides that, just, you know, for me to sit down and read. I mean, up into the, like, I'd say through grade school, I, I it was it was definitely like, <clears throat> you know, fifth, sixth grade going into middle school. I, it started to become more of a chore. School ruins it for mm -hmm. you. But when, yeah, when I was a kid, man, I loved reading. And I mean, I remember going to the library and just checking out fucking stacks of books. Z does that today, man. He loves, I mean, awesome. he's, 
he's learning to read uh, more, but you know, we read to him by we, I mean, mainly Kiele, uh, <laughs> reads to him a bunch. It's not that I don't like reading to him. He's just very particular. He likes Kiele <laughs> reading to really? him. Really? Yeah. Does she do the voices of the characters that she's reading to? Is that why? I don't know. She's just mommy. Mom. Mommy's definitely, she, it's still like mom, and then there's like everyone else. Yeah. And so. It's good. That's how yeah. it should be. No, no, I don't mind. No. She's, that's, that's how it's she mom. has in my eyes too. Yeah. So, she's great. That's good. Uh, she's a great lady. I love her. So, <laughs> Um, but anyways, yeah, and I read a bunch and remember being into those things. And so then was your, was your mom or dad into reading quite a bit? I guess. I think my dad was into reading. I'm trying to remember, like, I don't remember them just, I mean, they read to me. So I definitely got read to as a kid. I don't think like, you know, a whole bunch or anything. I mean, this was just, it was just normal shit. Normal. Yeah. I don't know. It, there was definitely no engineering. You know, like people do today, like playing Mozart to the fetus, <laughs> right? Um, I'm basically, I'm trying to find a reason why my parents screwed me up, so I can blame my dad for me oh, being great. Yeah. That's what I'm digging at. Well, we already figured that out, it's because you smoked weed in high school. We did figure that out. During, <laughs> during my very developmental years, I was stunting my intellectual growth. We were talking about this earlier. Copious amounts of marijuana. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, no, but it is funny that now you mentioned it, how reading just became a different... Thing. I read a few books in high school. I had one English teacher who's my track coach that was uh, um, like super influential for me. Kind of like my my parents were divorced, so you know he's like my surrogate father type thing. And so uh, he would he suggested a few books for me that I would read. Like I read Dune because uh, he suggested that one. So um, so yeah, I read some, but yeah, I've, I've always liked reading. I remember going to kindergarten. That was a funny thing. I went to kindergarten, and a kid in my class could read, and I couldn't. I was like, oh, fuck this shit. Not cool. So I went home and told my mom. I was like, I got to learn to read, man. I got to learn. You got to teach me how to read. So, yeah, it kind of she taught me how to read, and it's like, all right, let's go. You know, it's funny. When I was, I can't, I don't remember what grade this was, but I was thinking about this the other day when I was reading. I always loved like when you'd go around a class and the teacher would have you say you were reading a chapter from your history book or whatever. Yeah. And each kid would read like a paragraph yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they'd go around the room. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know some kids hated that. Like, I loved it. Like, I, I, I always challenged myself. Like, all right, how long can I go without messing up a word? Or before I run into a word that I, uh, yeah. I'm not going to be able to pronounce. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was always kind of like a competition to me. That's I made it to the end of the paragraph and I didn't screw up. Right, yeah. I was always pumped. That's funny. Yeah, I like that too. I remember that. I haven't thought about that since yeah. forever. But, uh, yeah. No, of I course, mean, I turned it into a competitive thing. I don't even remember to, to the extent. Like, so as I got closer to me, I'd count the kids off and count the paragraphs off. And so I knew which paragraph I'd be reading. And I'd read it. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't totally be listening to anything, not learning shit. Right, right. I was so worried about fucking reading my paragraph properly. I know. They're trying, I missed the whole lesson. The whole point is to keep people engaged. <laughs> and making everybody read and... And no one is because no. they're just like you know if you were doing that yeah, other, yeah, I wasn't the only kid doing yeah, that yeah I still remember doing that too like okay I know what I'm going to read yep so pretty that's read funny. it like oh I'm going to kill it there's a tough word in here yeah okay. fuck dude that's funny <laughs> fucking meatheads Jesus dude school they try I guess I just don't think they know what to do it was like school was created in a different time they were trying to make factory workers and it's just not where we're at today. We're trying to figure it's a out how you. Time. Yeah, dude. The, the 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 hole that we're trying to fit kids into has changed shape. It's like it's not square anymore, and uh, they just keep trying to shove those fucking square pegs in the whatever Round shape hole, hole it is. <laughs> yeah. So some kids fit, but a lot of kids don't. Most don't. Most don't, man. So, yeah, we were actually uh, Shiloh's school. God, man, I'm. I wish I had something like this when I was in school. I wouldn't have been able to do it. My parents would have been like, fuck you. I probably wasn't responsible enough. But this hybrid homeschool uh, school thing, because she goes to school once a week. So she has a class. She has teachers. Uh, she gets to do things with her, her school. They go on field trips and do things. But the other four days of the week, she's homeschooled. So that one day she's there all day? Yeah. Just yeah. like a normal school Just day? Just like a normal school day. And... Um, it is a pretty sweet combo. It is. It works really well. Yeah. And so yeah, we were there at her school yesterday. They were having like a barbecue and talent show thing, and it's an interesting mix of kids because you have 
uh, there's a lot of kids in the program that are in the program because they're they're not they don't do well with regular school, and you know they've been in trouble. They've you know almost like kind of this is one of their last chances uh, at school, and then you got kids like Shiloh and and other kind of uh, kids who are into sports and high performing kids, and so they've got practice schedules or, or whatever that this doesn't allow them to have regular school hours. And so, um, so you've got these two extremes, you know, and some kids in the middle. And so it, it's definitely an interesting mix, but, um, is this something that the kid has to apply for or is it just parents? Yeah. discretion? Yeah, no, you got to apply for it. it. I mean, they're a school, they're a school in, in district 51. So they're, they're part of the school district and, um, yeah, you have to, you know, Shiloh living here is fruit is for school, but, you know, like, uh, this is a school of choice area, I guess. And so you can apply and, and if there's room, your kid can go to any school in the, in the Valley. And so, uh, that school, the Grand Valley, what is it? Grand River Academy. Um, same thing. You have to apply for it, which is funny. Cause we were told that it's not easy to get into. And there's a waiting list. And then we applied for it. And like two days later, they gave us a call and they're like, so yeah, Shiloh wants to come here. She can come here. And I, I don't know for sure, but I think it's one of those things like they look like, dude, she's a straight A student. Yeah. I mean, she's she's a good student. Talk to a teacher or two or something. They're like, oh yeah. Yeah, she's... That's a, that's a Wilson kid. She's all right. Yeah, she's <laughs> not doing it for like disciplinary reasons or, you know, it's not another, uh, um, yeah, headache, I guess. And you hate to say that about kids, but and in, in honestly, on some level, this is what I realized too. Like, man, a lot of times it's not the kids. The kids are the proxy for the parents' problems. And you're like, you know, the kids are kind of, uh, screwed mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. You know, I bet you there's, I, this me being kind of optimistic, but I bet you there's quite a few kids that quote unquote were trouble kids, you know, always getting in trouble at school because, you know, as kids are not meant to be stuffed in the desk for that many hours. Oh, for day. sure. You know, and so I bet you there's quite a few kids that would be are considered trouble kids they put them in that program and they probably do just fine yeah i would have to assume i would hope yeah you know what i mean because it, it's tough to stuff a kid into a it desk is. and not get in trouble once in a while well man. you know what's funny is if I, as i was talking about i was thinking about it, i'm like man so this this school the system that they're using seems to work really well for the two extremes mm -hmm. right the kids that need help and the kids that are like really uh you know kind of like high performers um and which is funny because they're the ones that get lost in regular school because they're just trying to get that middle. Like they're just trying to toe that middle line. And it's like the kids who need help aren't getting the help that they need to really get high, you know, high enough as they need to really be functioning. You know, they might pass some tests and score high enough to keep the school where it needs to be, but they're not really like getting the help they need to, to, to progress. And then you got the, the high performing kids. And I've, I think I've told you before, I, I remember, I forget what grade it was, but there was a project that Shiloh turned in and she had an A on it. And I was looking it over and I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't right. What, what's going on here? And I realized that this teacher uh, saw Shiloh's name and just put an A on it because she does good work. She, she knows she's a good kid, right? Yeah, she usually does get A's and doesn't make mistakes like this. So she's not even checking. So she's falling through the cracks the other way. And, and that happens a lot with kids that are... It does, man. You know, yeah. Overachievers, so to speak. And it, it, it ruins them because they end up like getting grades and things that they don't deserve. And they're not being challenged. Like everything's just easy. And so then by the time they get to their first challenge, they're like, well, what the fuck is this? Like a lot of those kids fall apart uh, when things start getting harder and more competitive. Because, you know, the, the teachers are just trying to get those man, just get that middle. Like they just got to get those, those test scores above a certain point. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, they're, they're motivated by the wrong things. They're motivated by these numbers and having to, you know, meet these statistics that they're being graded by, uh, and missing the point. It's like, man, if you're doing, if the kids are learning and, and growing and progressing, then those scores will come about as a result of it. But if you're going into this, just trying to make sure the kids, pat, you know, score, get the scores they need to, again, you're missing the point. Like your intent fucking matters. 
And unfortunately, man, I just, school is not set up for the intent to be like really teaching people how to be like fucking solid people who know how to think well and problem solve well and handle money and, uh, you know, make critical decisions. Like that's just, that's not the shit that we're fucking teaching people. So anyways, so I choose not to participate. My kids are doing the homeschool. You know, I could see, I mean... I have no fucking expertise or education in this area, but I'll go ahead and predict anyways. Like I could see that they that becoming really popular and, yeah. and moving that way. Just the way the world is now, it the way is, society's yeah. going. They like, I could see that being a pretty common thing. Yeah. Well there's a whole nother homeschool only. Shallow did fifth grade and it. it's it's a completely separate thing where they're mm-hmm. just homeschooling. It's another District 51 associated uh, quote unquote school and they have their own campus and they have stuff where the kids come on there, but they don't have like the school Mm -hmm. element. So it's a little bit different. So yeah, I mean, there's two completely different options for homeschool in this little valley. valley, And that's just the two that I know of. And then you got people that just do it because you don't have to be part of the school district. You can homeschool your kid. Like we do it through the school district, uh, Variations because it allows her to participate in sports. I said that's that's the sweet combination in my eyes because now, <clears throat> so when it comes to the learning aspects and you know you guys can kind of help direct that better, but for the social and the, and the sports and yeah. and stuff like that, you still yep. can do all the school stuff. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. She can choose classes. Yep. Uh, so starting next year, she can start taking some classes at the high school or at the school that, um, and so you have kind of a hybrid schedule that way as well. So that'll be good. Like getting her in some of the art classes and things like that, where she'll have some teachers helping guide her, uh, will be good. So yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm pumped on it every once in a while. She's like, she, she, it's like, ah, I think I might want to go to high school cause you know, just so I can have the experience. And I'm like, you do not want that. I don't know what makes you think. You want that. But the first time you got to be at school at, you know, 730, whatever time it is, you got to be there and it's freaking winter and it's dark outside <laughs> and you got to walk over there because I'm not driving you over there because I can literally see the freaking school she goes to from our house and uh, you're going to be like, I made a terrible mistake. <laughs> I made a terrible, terrible mistake. And like you got to you got it so good right now you don't even know and I don't know what you think you're going to gain by going to high school and having to deal with I can't think of a single fucking positive thing nope like just it's because the the adults have no authority anymore it used to be a completely different thing when you at least had adults running the show and you don't the inmates run the show now (laughs) the inmates run the asylum man and it's like why would you send your kid into into a fucking situation like that like it, it just it makes it's it's a recipe for disaster. There's it's so hard to see what positive can come from it, and then you look around and you see like all the problems and all the issues with you know kids in high schools, and it's like, well, fuck, man, you guys are fucking these kids over, and then you guys are scared of them, and so nobody's taking charge, and dude, yeah. Anyways, anyways, there you go. I won't get started. Good on. luck. Haha, <laughs> good luck with that one. So, no, nah, people I think will just, I think like you said, homeschool, people taking the option, just taking it back into their own hands more, which is really where it should be. I mean, that's how it was for a long time. And uh, I think it's good to have public schools because everybody needs that education. But I think that what happened a lot of the ways along the way is we just, we, we just gave away our parenting. We said, oh, the school will do it for us. And so... Anyways, pendulum's got to swing back the other way some. So, all right. Anyways, fuck else we're gonna talk about? I got something to talk you about before we jump into the topic. Yes. Yeah, I don't like the way. <laughs> Dude, I'm ready to watch your blood boil. Oh fuck. Dude, yes. <clears throat> Let me go drink water, prepare myself. Okay, you ready for this? I'm ready. Have you heard of the term gym intimidation? Gym, like like G Y M. Yes. Gym intimidation. I have not. Okay. Heard of this, dude? This is so insane. So gym intimidation is apparently the phenomenon where females 
uh, are intimidated and, and stay away from the gym and don't train because they're intimidated by the men. Okay. In the atmosphere in the gym, but mainly the, the men are behind the atmosphere. And so I was, I found this, this is what passes for science these days. Apparently science is finding 25 ladies who feel that going to the gym is intimidating and that when they go into the, the freeway area that there are men that look at them. Okay. This is science. Interviewing these ladies and asking them questions and, 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 you know, them saying, you know, yes. And I'm sure a lot of these questions that they're asking them are like leading, like, you know, are you intimidated to walk into the freeway area because you feel that men are staring at you? And it's like, well, yeah. I never thought about I, it. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? And it's like, well, wait a minute. Okay, first mm -hmm. of all, you know, going to the gym is intimidating for everyone. Everybody. Uh, when I walk into the freeway zone, I feel that there's dudes staring at me and it can be intimidating. You got some fucking big gorilla staring at you. And, and, and so it's not just, you know, women. And this is, and so he was saying that, so this was the premise, man, gym intimidation. And, and this is, that, that this is one of the reasons that some women don't work out. This is the way that I saw it was like, it's not only like a, another, like just uh, slam on men and just, you know, jab at men, but also another excuse for fatties. To say, I don't go to the gym because of gym intimidation. And so it's not my fault. It's not my fault. I I'm can't fat. exercise. I would go to the gym and work out. And I would do the things that I need to do. But those stinky men are there. And they intimidate me. And so therefore, I can't go. And so that's why I'm fat. And so I, I, I could be totally wrong. But I kind of felt like there was another... Uh, just It seems to be another popular... Um, theme, I guess, is, is giving fatties more excuses. And so, but yeah, so the study, they find these 25 ladies that they interview who are saying that they, you know, find it intimidating to walk into a gym and that they think that men are, are looking at them. And uh, I'm like, dude, fucking you think, right? Like, Maybe you're a narcissist. <laughs> yeah. Maybe no one's looking at Maybe you. No one's looking no at one's you. No one's looking at you, but you are just fucking self conscious and you think that people are looking at you. You don't even fucking know, right? You're just saying, I, I feel like they are. And the other thing was that, um, you know, they walk into these areas and they have this equipment that's specifically designed for men. And I'm like, wow, in a freeway area, what, what equipment specifically designed for men? And so I read a little further and they said, like the squat racks. You know, at the gym I went into, I measured, and the pins for the squat rack only allow for someone who's up to five foot one. And so a woman who's under five foot one won't fit this piece of equipment. And so this is obviously designed for men only. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. I'm like, what a, what a fucking height gender assumptive this guy is. <laughs> Right? Like, you think only women can be under 5'1"? Like, it's not made for men. It's made for people over 5'1". Over 5'1". Which tall. includes men and women. <laughs> like, I understand that it, there's probably a higher percentage of people under 5'1 who are women. But that doesn't mean, like... That, was, that rack wasn't specifically designed for that. Like, this is a man-only rack. Right. Right. Must be this tall to ride this ride. Yes. I'm like, wow, what a bigot that fucking guy is for just making that assumption. And that, you know, that, that men's shit. And so, so they're talking about how uh, the their recommendations and the recommendations. Was this a real article? I swear to fucking God, man. This it was in like, like The Guardian. It was in one of those UK, like British, like those fucking guys are a little more social justice warrior than we are. And we're pretty far off the rails. But those dudes are like another level over there and so um man yeah when people free speech and guns baby like that's what separates us from everyone else out there and so <laughs> if, when you when you want to take those things away just look at some of this crazy shit but anyways um yeah man no it's in the guardian it was like or something one of those one of those british like online newspapers uk something i could be killing it um uk telegraph or some shit. something man and, but no, this motherfucker actually presented his findings at a conference. Like this study. That he did this study and he, and he presented these findings to a conference. And, and then this gets picked up and, and uh, published in a mainstream news outlet. And so, no, 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 man. It's, I'm, 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 I fucking, 
I, I couldn't believe it, man. I'm like, it's, it's ridiculous. It's super ridiculous. Super ridiculous. But yeah, that was that was it. They were they were just trying to. Oh, so their their recommendations were that they should try to integrate things more. That the women felt like there was too much of a separation. That there was a women's area and a men's area, and that that well, was yeah, they want shit set up for them. And that that was part of the problem, and they needed to kind of integrate things better. And but one of their recommendations was to not have the abs and stretching area next to the freeway area. And I'm like, wait a minute, like your recommendation is to integrate, integrate things but better, then you're trying to segregate. but now you're telling me we need to segregate these areas because I mean, you know, so obviously, what the fuck do you want? I know, I know. They were taught it, it was insanity, dude. When you read this and you're like, dude, this is the only people who read this and aren't like losing their minds are dumbasses who want this to be true like they they already see this right and and so they're they're just like getting more reinforcement for what they already see there's no critical thought there's nothing being put into their reading of this they are just absorbing it and then they're going to walk out and and tell people like well there's a study that showed that gym intimidation is real. It's real. And that people are, that gyms are segregating and, and the, the women from everyone else and they're making it difficult. You know what I mean? They're going to do it. There's someone out there who's quoting that fucking study in, in, to, for, in, for some bullshit reason out there right now. Maybe not right now. I mean, I am. <laughs> <laughs> There's Someone definitely a right bullshit now. reason. <laughs> so, um, but anyways, dude. So there you go. I... Man, I think you hit it right on the head when you said it's more uh, people looking. It could be a lot of things, but it's a lot of it's people looking for reasons to blame other people for them being out of shape and unhealthy and just not happy with themselves. It's not their fault. Yeah. Society set up for me to to not exercise. It's yeah. Too difficult. Like science is about finding excuses and finding like. I just sound like a scientist that's fucking bored and needs to study something real. I can't believe that's science, man. It's pretty I, ridiculous. I forget who it was. I was listening to somebody. I think Graham Hancock. He was talking about, like, he was saying, like, archaeology, and I think, like, a lot of the social sciences. He was like, man, they're not sciences. They're philosophies. Yes, I'm saying that's, yeah, that, that's a really good way to put it. Because that's what I was just thinking. Like, you're calling it science. How are you, like, in my eyes, I'm not a fucking scientist, but for me, one of the things to classify something as science as opposed to philosophy or theory is being able to measure something, having a, a measure solid, it and then repeat it. And then repeat, but you have to have a good solid measure, like something yes. weighs one pound. Yep. It is, you know, whatever. Right. But gym t- intimidation, feelings. Yes, I'm measuring well, these fucking feelings. Like you put an electrode on my fucking head. And right. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. A feeling. It's not a real science, it's not man. A real science, no. And but that's the problem. It's it's but it's presented as a science, and so you think it's like oh. This guy's in the same class as people who are like fucking working on quantum physics. It's like no, 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 no. That is that is not the same thing. It's like calling a psychologist a doctor. Like you know, like yes, I know they have the same name, but you know, referring to a brain surgeon and someone who sits there and talks to you about your feelings, it's not the same thing. Not the, not same, the thing. same thing, man. Not the same thing. So um, a little misleading that way. So, anyways. Anyways. It's a gym intimidation, buddy. Yeah, that is, uh, I was able to maintain myself. You know, what's sad is like, you just, you weren't, you just, you're, you're kind of numb to it at this point. I am. Because it's, there's so much ridiculous shit that goes on in this world when it comes to transgender bullshit and equality nonsense. Like, yeah, it's, you hear that and it's not surprising. Yeah. At all. You're like, yeah, there's some fucking idiots out there subscribing to that. Uh, yeah. And I, following that up. So it's not that surprising. It just, and it's just in, you know, the, 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 the clickbait title yep. says one thing. And if you just read the clickbait title, this study showed that women are intimidated and, and this is, dude, and gym intimidation is real. Gosh, dude, that's so much of what you find when you're looking online to research shit is great articles, big, bold letters, some you know, attention grabbing title then if you take the time to read the article it is this fluff fucking nonsense nonsense so much of that shit dude yeah it's, it's so frustrating because you you waste so much of your life you're trying to educate yourself on a topic so you, you start going to the google machine and trying to find stuff and dude like you just come across so much fucking nonsense as soon as you read more than one paragraph into it you're like yeah 
Dude, I read one on so Kratom HD. last night that fucking blew my mind. It was like, you know, new herbal, you know, whatever comes with risks or something like that. Like, they're all about, like, you know, the risks involved with it. And, man, I'm reading it, and it is the, the like you said, dude, it is a fluff piece. It, there's nothing substantial in it. It is just like they were talking about some county in Indiana that hasn't seen Kratom use yet, but is uh, worried about it because they've heard about it. And they, they uh, um, God, it was ridiculous. This lady's like, well, I'm pretty sure the DEA is trying to get it on the schedule, you know, list and, and get it illegal because of, you know, this stuff. And it's like, wait a minute, do you work for the DEA? Like, do you know this? Like, you're just some no, fucking no. spokesperson at the local police department or some bullshit. And, like, there was nothing substantial in it. There was nothing in it. You're reading it, and they, at no point did they present anything that, that actually made Kratom look bad outside of these fucking police officers and people going, like, oh, well, you know, we're afraid that kids are going to try to use it. So, or, or something, you know, and they're like, we, you know, there, there were 44 deaths associated with Kratom. And, of course, all of them had other substances in their blood, but... Uh, we haven't seen We're not going to talk about that. Yeah, no, I know. But it, but this is a common... Yeah. You see this over and over and in these that articles. Message, that's where we got to fucking plant the flag for Kratom and how good it is. I think and, that's... And spread the, spread the news. I mean, because even the other day, you know, we had a mutual friend that we were talking about Kratom with. And the first thing he said, he's like, oh, is that the new Salvia? Yeah. And so it's got that that initial image. Yeah. And we got to fix that. Yeah. Because it's not that at all. No. Dude, it, it is not that in any way, shape, or form. That's like comparing fucking I don't coffee know, to LSD, coffee man. Coffee to crack or something. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, it, it, it's such a leap. It's, it's like, like, dude, you're not going to hallucinate when you have a cup of coffee. No. You know, like you're not going to fucking leave this conscious realm when you have Kratom. No. Like it's just not it's that not, type of thing. But that's kind of, that's a message you're trying to get out there. Oh yeah. And that's, yeah. Well, and the thing too is it's almost like, okay, if you really boil it down and you got down to it, it's like, what is bad about Kratom? It makes you feel good and it gives you energy. That's so terrible. Wait a minute, what? Like, that's what makes it bad. It, it, again, it's just fucking, again, why? If you really boil it down, it's like, well, because we have our roots in this, all you need is Jesus bullshit. <laughs> right? Like, it, it, if, if, it, if it makes you feel good and it gives you energy, it must be, it must be evil. It, it must, must be, be evil. from the devil. It's got to be bad. Well, you know, it comes from the same family as a coffee plant. I know. Same fucking thing. That's, I mean, it's not the same thing, but it comes from that same line. That's the insane thing, dude. Like, we think and nothing of drink, pumping sugar and caffeine into by the everybody gallons, by, by the, the fuck, gallons. No big deal. Don't even no big deal, man. Not a problem. And, but man, yeah, you start talking about Kratom or even, even fucking weed, marijuana. Like, my, my stepdad um, has... Uh, really bad bursitis in his heel mm -hmm. and of course we know bursitis is medical code for we don't know what the fuck's yep. going on but we can't admit that we don't know what's going on and tell you that you probably need to seek some other advice and so, so we put a fancy name we're gonna to put it. an itis on it yeah. and then just tell you to rest and give you cortisone shots and while well, you fuck yourself over further because we can't admit that we don't know what's going on um so you know he's got bursitis in his heel and there's dude just Right off the bat, I can think of, you know, he needs to lose weight. He doesn't exercise. He's, you know, there, there's there's like a lot of low-hanging fruits, like easy things on the table that you could be like, hey, man, maybe you could try this and it'll help. But no, it's like, no, you got bursitis, brother. There's nothing you can do about it. And it's like, well, anyways, it drives me nuts. And so, but I asked uh, my mom if he had tried the CBD rub on it because I just know how much it helped my elbows. And she's like, no, 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 you won't even touch that stuff. And because he is, uh, he works in a job that is tied to the FAA. So he gets drug tested. He gets drug tested basically by FAA standards, the same standards that they use for, you know, pilots. Mm -hmm. And there's zero tolerance uh, in their standards. And they can test for such minuscule amounts of THC that if you use a CBD rub that has a trace amounts of THC in it because we have a, you, we have a mutual friend that had that happen to yeah, you could potentially fail the test could potentially fail the test and so he was told that they had a meeting I guess when the CBD stuff started getting more popular 
they said, uh, where do he not worked. Touch it. Well, they said that you know they can't tell you that, but they're like, you just have to. You're taking that risk, yep. and so you have to decide: is it worth it to take that risk? And so obviously, the underlying message there is no, uh, it's not. And so for him, he can't uh, can't use it. So he's got this thing that could potentially help, but he can't use it because of people's views on you know THC and marijuana and because again like I know like you don't want pilots being high when they're flying um you know and fuck I could probably even argue that like I do yeah, things even I, better I, high sometimes I, I, how many of them are flying on Adderall right like flying on fucking Oxycontin right I, yes yes yeah 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 pain yeah. pills and it's shit like, oh, you, but you worry about them fucking flying high on I know. Put a CBD rub. Yeah, yeah, I know, but that's that's it's the thing, thing, right? So, so I know. Okay, I, 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 I will at least say like, all right, I don't want my my pilots flying high, but there's got to be some way to uh, figure out with this testing to be like, okay, look, a certain amount under a certain amount. It's obvious that you didn't smoke weed yesterday. Like the, these trace amounts are only gonna be here for you know, from a CBD rub or a tainted supplement or something like that. And so, uh, but yeah, just, but the fact that they're like, nah, they're the, nope, you know, we're not even going to venture to review the rules. Um, but I mean, it's funny, man. It took like, uh, like the UFC or whoever does their testing. Cause they talked about like, they've changed their marijuana yeah. testing standards. They're like, it was just getting ridiculous. Like we're, people were getting popped for, just they're not smoking weed. It's obvious that they're not smoking weed by the amounts that are in them. It, this is trace amounts left over, and this is fucking ridiculous. So it's take a while. I think we got to just like I say, keep marching forward. Tell yeah. everybody about kratom. Yeah, get the good news, and good info out there. Get people trying it. Like, yeah, because I don't want to see it go that way and have to fight that fight. You know? Yeah, I know, man. I'm just, I'm, I'm. You think it's gonna? Don't I you? don't know though, because here's the thing, right? Like the two, the the internet is such a wild card. Well, speaking of that, so, so have you watched the documentary? Uh, I, haven't, I haven't watched Le- it. Leaf of Faith no. on Netflix. No, dude, you got to watch it. Chris but, Bell, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Chris Bell. You know he did Bigger, Stronger, Faster, yep. Trophy Kids, all that shit. Uh, prescription thugs. Um, you know when he came last that last time he was on Joe Rogan. That was one of his big motivating factors for going on there because it was good. This was like 2016 That's or 17. Right. That's right. They were, it was going up before the DEA, yeah. you know, the government. They were going to, they were voting on whether to make it a schedule one or not. Yep. And so he went on JRE and, um, you know, basically stated the case, explained it and said, Hey, everybody, if you're concerned about this, let's send a letter, you know, uh, send an email, sort of letter to your local government. And here they even like put a link to it. Yeah. And uh, the government got bombarded with people. Yeah. Like, hey, hey, like this has changed my life. This has helped me. This is not the same thing as fucking crack, cocaine, or anything. Yeah. Like you can't take. Don't take this from us. Yeah. And they were overwhelmed. They're like, oh, we didn't realize what we were getting into, and so they backed off. Right. But is it going to come up again? Because there is still a few states in this country that it's illegal. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a few, God, a few. There's like five or six of them. Wow, oh. kratom is illegal. Kratom's illegal. Like fucking Alabama or some shit, Arkansas or some shit. Of course, Mortals. like opioid epidemic. Yeah, yeah. Central. That's they made that point too. Like one of the one of the states that has like the highest rate of like adults on opioids is of course one that's you know, kratom is illegal in. But uh, you know, I mean, the one thing that we do have going for us, we live in fucking Colorado, baby. We got mushrooms on the ballot in Denver. Yeah. So. If they do make kratom illegal on a federal level, like I, I wouldn't put it past being much long, too long before Colorado made it legal, mm-hmm. and it became like fucking mushrooms and pot and you know, where we we can buy it, but it's illegal on a federal level. So we do kind of got that going for us. We do live in like the fucking most progressive state when it comes to these things. So everybody just watches us and says. Hmm. Shit seems to be working all right. Maybe we'll, we'll just keep leading the charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully it doesn't come to that point. But I, I think the internet, that, that is the wild card, right? Because that was the, uh, you can mobilize more voices so quickly for something. 
And so, uh, you know, like marijuana never had that chance. Like when it was, you know, back in the fucking 20s or 30s, like when it was being demonized, like there was no way for people to have their voices heard. And so uh, now that's not the case. And so I, I wonder, I hope so, because it, it would, uh, man, it would be a bummer, man. It would be a, a big bummer if they did that, just because it is, it's ridiculous. There's no reason, you know, you look at the science, you look at the actual uh, numbers and like, there's nothing to support it being a schedule one on any schedule uh, drug list with the DEA. And the only reason is because you're, you're talking about, uh, like I said, these, these puritanical Christian, uh, you know, values that still underpin a lot of the shit that we do. The same thing that brought about like, uh, prohibition, right? And then you got money, uh, the, the pharmaceutical company. Money talks. Right. But in those two things, man, like they just, they create ignorance. Like those two elements, money and tradition just creates so much willful ignorance in people that that's what, you know, that's what frustrates me. And that's what kind of, I guess, scares me if you, if I'm going to use that word about it is I just, I know how powerful those forces are. And so I'm sitting here trying to weigh it out. Like, you know, but the, the thing is, is can the voices make the people who are upholding the tradition and have the money worried enough about their position to to change right that's kind of what's happened with marijuana and so uh so anyways that's the game man that's the eternal game with these things we'll find out we will find out but in the in the interim man yeah kratom's fucking awesome i'm a huge fan i'm a kratom convert but it's funny man yeah you start talking to people about it and you can see right away man that is very common response, man. So I'll, I'll mention it to somebody, and that's the first thing they'll say. Oh, it's salvia. Or, oh, you get strung out, or blah blah blah. Like, it's always negative right away. Yeah. I'm like whoa, 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 whoa. Or even yeah. if you try to like, yeah, or like, hey, man, no, it's it's like energy with a side of happiness. It's, good it's way like to put it. it's the best way for me to describe it to people, and and uh, it's and and that right there just makes people again. There's this thing in our society where if you take something that makes you feel happy. Especially if it didn't come from a doctor, a doctor prescribing it. There's just got to be something inherently wrong with it. There's got to be something inherently evil about any substance that, that makes you feel happy. It must be the devil. It must be the devil. Like, yeah. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a weird, weird um, mental uh, yeah, just thing that our society has about it. And, you know, it's kind of funny on this whole society and drugs and shit. So yesterday, on my way back from Vail, right, I had to go get my knee checked out. I stopped at the weed shop, and it just so happened it was one of my coworkers parked on the side of the road. You know, I don't know, he must have been taking his lunch break or something. Yeah. And he could see the parking lot of the weed shop. I made sure to park right in front of him, fucking <laughs> wave at him. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, look at me walking into the weed store. That's funny, man. I wasn't, I, I couldn't quite recognize who was in the truck, so I'm not sure if it was like one of my buddies. Right. Yeah, and then as I drove by him, I honked at him. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see if that word gets around when I get back to work. <laughs> That's going to be entertaining. It's funny, yeah. man. So. Anyways. Yeah. All right. All right. Gonna jump into today's topic. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is a good one, man. I was surprised when you came up with this one last night. And I, to be honest, I was a little like nervous when you first mentioned it. I was like, oh, fuck. Like, I got to think about this one. Yeah. Anyway, so the topic is... What if you could go back? What would you say to your white belt self? Yeah, if you found a time travel machine and you could go back and and talk to your white belt self, what advice would you give him to kind of, yeah, help him on the journey ahead? Yeah. I mean, like so. you say, when you first mentioned it, I was a little nervous because you you threw out the number at first, like what are five things? You know, just yeah, but it didn't matter. I was, so I was like, oh fuck, can I come up with five things? Like, I had to think way back, you know, but then once I started, once I sat down, I said, like, I came up with, like, seven or eight pretty easy. Okay. And then I stopped. I was like, all right, let's just yeah. stop there, you know, so. I came up with, like, seven or eight, too. Did you? Yeah. It was the same thing, though, man. I sat down, and I was talking to Kelly. It was, for me, it was interesting because, like, coming from mountain biking and being a coach and just, you know, knowing the things that I knew I don't feel like I came into jujitsu with a whole lot of illusions. Like I knew it was going to be a grind. 
I knew that I was gonna just I was gonna suck and there was gonna be ups and downs like I because I'd experienced all that with mountain how biking. old were you when you started how long ago did I mean, you start? As a, I was like 37 you've been at it for 36, five 37, years now six years seven years seven years yeah you're 44 no I'm 43 43 okay yeah so I'll be 44 this year okay but uh yeah yeah, so I didn't, I didn't really come into it with, you know, so there wasn't any of those like, well, I'd go back and tell myself like, hey man, you know, you're going to have these, be paid, you know, some of that stuff, uh, I, I, I came into it and I, I knew it and that's why I wanted to, I wanted to be a white belt again, I wanted to experience all that shit again, so, um, and then two, you know, you run into the thing of, like I, I, I feel like my jujitsu is on a good path. Right, like I got a long way to go, but I I feel I feel like it's on a good path, and so there's not like the path that you're on, like where you're at today, is a result of all of the things in the past. Right, you couldn't go back and and change something significant in the past, thinking that you'd end up in the same end, spot. end up in the same spot. I, I kind of I ran into that thought process too when I started thinking. About yeah, this. so there were some things I didn't want to go back and just be like, hey man, like. You know, I don't know. Like I said, like there, there were some, there were some tough lessons that I had to learn that made, that that helped my jujitsu. And that if somebody would have came and gave me like a cheat code, basically, I don't know that my jujitsu would be in the same place. Like it might have helped me initially a little bit, but anyways, I don't know if that makes sense. No, but. it makes perfect sense. Like, yeah, because the every part of that struggle is what's got you to where you're at. Yeah, if you're happy to where you're at. Yeah, there's no reason to change anything. Right. Yeah, I thought about the same thing too because, yeah, it's all about the struggle. Yeah. And all the shit you learn. Yeah. But anyways. Sure. Okay, so I don't know. So mine mine were all like, I guess most of it was kind of advice, but I had one where I was like patting myself on the back too. Okay. For for being a good white belt rob. Okay. But anyways. So who wants to go first? Um... So what I was, what, uh, I wonder if any of our, I bet you there's going to be a few of them that. So I was thinking maybe we should like, we should, uh, go over, like just throw them out there. Like I'll, I'll throw out mine. Okay. And then you throw out yours. Maybe we'll go from there. And then I think we can go from there because I think some of them will overlap. Yep. And then that way we can kind of like pick and, and choose from there. Um, all right. So, God damn, I wrote down a bunch. I'll, I'll, I'll pare it down a little bit. Number one. <laughs> Is, uh, Are these in any significant order? No, 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 no. Just kind of came in my head. Gotcha. Uh, number one is leg locks work. <laughs> okay. Right? Like, because we talked about one of the things, it's not necessarily mistakes you made, but it could be like paths that you chose. Like, leg locks for me, there are definitely times when I could have diverted path, man. Like, you know, stop just grabbing people's fucking, an- an- you know, ankles. And I could have taken that the wrong direction and, and abandoned that. And it's like, I feel like that was. He's like, no, man, it's good. You stuck with that. It worked. <laughs> that's, that's a weird... Okay, go ahead. I'm, um, it's funny. I'd say competing gets less scary. My white belt self would not believe me, but I would tell him that. Uh, mobility and ramping isometrics. I wish I'd known that from the beginning. That would have saved me some fucking wear and tear. Fuck yeah. Uh, drilling is the key to improving. Like, embrace the drill class. Um, the... Uh, I would, I'd, I had a couple like technique things like one like learn headlocks and guillotine sooner like I, I wish I'd I'd learned that like made an effort to learn that sooner uh, and anyway then we talk about that more and then also like don't forget about closed guard and I, I wish I could go back and tell my white belt self about the pit stop the pit stop position and closed guard like I I, I think that would have made my life a little easier and I wouldn't mind having that lesson a little sooner <laughs> so um it's funny i didn't i didn't think of any technique things like that but anyways no no um i put uh or i got nogi is awesome you're gonna like nogi it was one i wasn't sure about as a white belt and if i was gonna embrace that and then uh my last one was rob's not as scary as he pretends <laughs> <laughs> yes i am you be fucking putting up <laughs> I work hard at having this tough exterior so I don't get unsolicited conversations in public. Yeah. And yet somehow you somehow invite them still. still. fucking happens. You're right. God damn it. So see how that works for you. <laughs> All right. So those were mine, man. What right. uh, so, would you get? Here's mine in no specific order. Okay. Um, 
Uh, eight, I got eight of them here. So first, uh, isometrics. Yep, like you said, I wish I would have known about or been from, more familiar with isometric strength training. Yeah. Um, yep. Second, uh, and I already, you, you look at my notes. I wrote isometrics and recovery, mobility, in all caps. Because <laughs> I started. Let's see. Oh man, let's say I'll do. I'll be forty tomorrow, and I've been at this since. Fuck. 2004 let's say so that's 15 years ago yeah. right roughly yeah so i was 25 yeah when you're 25 and you're pretty athletic i don't remember anybody talking to me about fucking recovery or worrying about mobility yeah mobility do a little little yeah. bit yeah but no one would do, like recovery was not a common common conversation amongst my training friends you know like you and i talk about different recovery yeah. shit all the time yeah so, I don't know if that just came with age or if it's more popular nowadays. But yeah, sorry, I'm getting off track. No, Recover, no, no. Recovery mobility. Dude, I wish I would have known from the jump. Yeah. Like, hey, fucking spend a bunch of time on this. Anyways, uh, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. You know, just jiu-jitsu as a whole. You know, make sure to tell my weight belt stuff that. Uh, learning to prioritize your time, scheduling, you know, just with jiu-jitsu, outside life. Oh, yeah. I, I fucked that up a lot coming up. I mean, okay. I get a little too obsessed. But anyways, uh... That kind of falls into the set. These kind of overlap. Like, learn to be present. They, we'll, we'll go into it. Learn to be present. Um, don't take yourself too seriously. Uh, take better notes. Like, I, I've always been pretty good. At, I, I, I kept notes quite a bit as white belt, blue belt. But I should have been more detailed and more, you know, strict about it. Yeah. Instead of going through waves of it. Like, being real good about it and not doing it. And being real good about it. Anyways, um... And uh, then be proud that I didn't quit, because along my jujitsu journey, there was a lot of opportunities. I ran into a lot of roadblocks. Yeah. That could have just turned me right off from it. I'm like, ah, oh, fuck it. I'll just take up another hobby. This is. I'm having put too much effort into continuing my hobby. Right. Like, I'll just do something that takes less time and effort. Yeah. But I did not. I stayed stayed true to the course. Don't quit. Don't quit. That's right. right so. That's what we're gonna put on your grid. Your head marker. Don't quit. Don't quit. You quit. <laughs> Don't quit. <laughs> you fucking quit. Well, Rob didn't quit until this day. That's right. <laughs> he finally quit. He didn't quit. He retired. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so those are the, the eight that I have. So Nice, man. Those are good. Yeah. I like those. So, it's uh, funny. You and, I, you and I had a couple, but you kind of went like more technical route. Yeah. Which I guess isn't surprising. Well, I think, too, because, you know, like you said, man, I got into mountain biking at 24. Yep. Now, if you told me, what advice would you go back and tell your 24-year-old mountain biking self when he got into mountain biking? It'd probably be similar to what Very I similar stuff, yeah. man. A lot of similar stuff. Because, like I said, like I didn't know what I was in for. That was, that was like, uh, uh, what do they call it? Like, uh, um, ah, dude, I don't know. Fucking some ignorance where you don't know what... You don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And so you're like, Ignorance yeah, 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 yeah. You're happy about it, right? You don't know what the fuck you're getting into. So, uh, yeah, no, but I, I think that that's, um, but it's good though, right? Because, you know, some of the stuff that you touched on does go back to that. And, uh, um, but yeah, that's why mine was more like that. Cause I was thinking like that. I was like, man, I gotta be honest. I never, I knew what I was in for. Like, I didn't know exactly what it was going to be. I'm not going to say that. But you had a pretty good idea. I, I like the learning curves yeah. and the bumps and bruises and, and I, shit. Yeah, and I wanted that. I, I wanted to... I love that. Because like, I love that with mountain biking. And that's what I was missing with mountain biking. Because mountain biking had reached that point where it was just... you Being know, a little stale, kind of. Yeah, where I just progressed so far. Like I said, the consequences and effort for me to progress further than that. Like, the, the effort to benefit ratio doesn't really... It starts to not pan out. Uh, as much and so you know it's like trying to go from deadlifting 400 pounds to 600 pounds it's like it's a big jump fuck dude you're gonna and it's so much effort and you're gonna break yourself like that that jump is but anyway so I wanted to go back and be a white belt and just like all right that's awesome I'm gonna get frustrated I'm gonna get smashed I'm gonna come in some days and feel like Jesus dude I'm on fire this is awesome <laughs> the toughest motherfucker out come there. in the next day and be like what happened man where'd my jujitsu go God so damn it. Yeah, yeah, and, and even though I still got frustrated, and you know, we've had talks, because I've, I mean, you've seen me, like, you know, in the middle of being frustrated with some of my slumps and things like that, it was still, it still helped that I had had done it before, and I knew, man, like, you, you just know on the other side of it, that you're going to come through, 
because you've you've seen it before. Like once you've done it once, it's you can do it again. So, but uh, so yeah. Anyways, so how do you wanna you wanna fucking dig in? What what? Sure. Let's uh. Well, so we both had the the mobility and isometrics. Yeah. I think we probably just like recovery. Touch on that a little bit. Yeah. The mainly, man, just smart training. Yeah. Because you're. I mean, I miss a, a, a groin injury is what kind of prompted me to go to the Steve Maxwell thing and led me down this pathway. But man, I I had to miss the better part of a month of rolling and training because my groin injury had gotten so bad. And before that, dude, my groin injury, dude, dude, I remember, God, dude, it was just months of suffering. It started on my right side, so I changed how I rolled, and then it went to my left side. (laughs) And so I tried to change what I was doing, and then it just became like, a constant. A, a constant, like just a groin injury, Fight, yeah. and it just, it, yeah, and then it just, it was like, dude, I'm gonna like break something down there if I don't stop. And so it was just months and months and months of my jujitsu career that I was having to suffer, and, and my, you know, training was different, and then I had to actually just take time off, and all of it could have been avoided with good mobility. You know, the the isometrics have been several of just training related injuries. In fact, I. That had to take my bar out of the fucking apart. I was like, dude, doing deadlifts every once in a while, I just, oh, ah, god damn it, something <laughs> tweaked. And it's always lifting weights, doing something <laughs> like that, right? I never hurt myself doing isometrics. So I'm going to get a big ass sandbag. That's what I want. I want to get like a fucking like a strong, like a strong sandbag. man sandbag. Yeah. yeah. I almost bought one last summer. I think that's the I key, man. Out of it. I think the, the deadlifts are just, it's just a weird. Like, your body's like, what is this symmetrical, yeah. you know? Anyways, like, it's a different story. But, um, yeah, man, just it, it's about just not missing time from training because of stupid uh, ignoring, 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 ignoring stuff. Yeah, and then, you know, you had the recovery. I was probably a little more in recovery, just, you know, coming into it from my side. But it's getting the same thing. It's in the same vein. You know? It is. It, it's not, though, man, because, like, recovery, things like sleep. Right. right, like I bet you respect sleep a lot more a lot today more. than you did when you started. Nutrition, I am really I'm way more dialed in into how foods make me feel and yep. affect my training and the recovery. Way more. Yeah, and that just comes from years of living, you know, and experience. It does, yeah, yeah. I, yeah that, those are definitely lessons. That's why I wrote it down. Like, yeah, if I could go back and just get through my fucking twenty-five-year-old thick ass head, like how important this shit is. Yeah. Yeah, it would have benefited me. Yeah, for sure. That's maybe, probably, maybe I could have avoided these two goddamn knee surgeries, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, who knows, man? I mean, it's, it's uh, But that's the, the lessons we learn. and Yeah, that's probably the one thing I would go back. Like, I don't think there were any uh, lessons learned that made my jiu-jitsu better from my groin injury. <laughs> you know, like, I, I could have avoided all those injuries and my jiu-jitsu would be in the exact same place it is today. But I just, I wish I had, had uh, known about that stuff. And I knew about mobility. It was more like, you said, like recovery with you. You know, it's probably like you knew it, but you just didn't know how important it was. Didn't respect it. Didn't respect it the same way there you There was should. no, yeah, there was no, uh, oh God, there was no technique to my recovery back in those days. Yeah. You know what I mean? There was no, like, active recovery day. It was just, oh, I'm not training today. Just normal life and lay the fuck around. Try yeah. to do as little as possible. Yeah. That's not always... Now we know better. Now we know better. Yeah. Yeah. So... Anyway, so... Yeah. No, I agree, man. Those are two things that uh, I think anybody can start using right away. So, uh, um, what else I got here? I think, like, the the technique things that I had, you know, the, the leg locks, like I said, was really just kind of... I got started down that path. And there were several times along that path where I probably took it too far. And, but without taking it too far, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And so I'm just, I'm glad that I, I stuck with it instead of bailing on it. And, uh, um, but anyway, so leg lock thing. But the other two are just more like techniques I wish I had picked up earlier in my jujitsu career. That just looking at the success that I'm having with them now and how they open up so many other things. Uh, um, the, yeah, I wish that, that, that I'd have known about them, but the pit stop in particular is one that, cause I remember Lance showing it to me super early on. It just, it was one of those positions that people touched on, 
but it was just kind of like, like focus. Yeah, kind of glossed over. It's just glanced over, and again, like the pit stop. Again, we can't. I'll do my best to describe it, but it's like where you get one. It's not quite the high guard where you got both your legs capping both their shoulders. You basically got one leg capping one shoulder and the other legs in the regular closed guard position. You got your legs closed. So it's like a, you got your your, clothes, your guard closed, but... Over top of one of their shoulders. Yeah, one of your knees is over the top of one of their shoulders and you're capping it. And usually their arms stuck inside that little triangle you're creating. And so it's a really great spot to set up arm bars, shoulder lock. If they pull their arm Try out, the it. triangle's right there. The omoplata is there. You can hit sweep, the flower, flower sweep, sweep yeah. super easy from there. And so I really wish, like, like that's the one position. Like, that would have made my jujitsu and closed guard stuff much easier early on because it makes all of those things, trying to hit all those things so much easier than just trying to do them from straight closed guard. And so, yeah, if I'd have, that'd probably be my one secret i'd go back and whisper in my white belt self's ear and be like dude check this position out <laughs> learn it you know start using using it to launch your attacks from and if i had started doing that at white belt like fuck dude it would just be uh devastating at this point so um yeah and front headlocks guillotines just as a new white belt i i figure it's kind of rude to grab people's heads and squeeze when you don't know what you're doing <laughs> it is funny so i i'm just trying to goon somebody yeah just yeah get over head and squeeze as yeah, hard as possible exactly so i, I didn't really understand <laughs> guillotines and and front headlocks and how to use them and so like i i didn't i just didn't want to grab people's heads and and just you know i felt like it was just bad form and uh I had no consideration to that. Right. So, <laughs> that's, so that's I kind of avoided it. Yeah. Your personality and mind diverged. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. So those are I, those are kind of the the technique things. Like stick with the leg locks. But I wish I had I uh, known about the pit stop and close guard sooner. And I wish I had um, made an effort to learn about front head locks and guillotines sooner, so I could incorporate it into my game uh, sooner. But um, so yeah. I'll, I'll yes. knock those three off my list with that little diatribe. I don't know if you have any thoughts or no. I, I kind of that. interjected my thoughts in the process of that little yeah talk. Cool. Because yeah, you get, I mean, if you start going down that technique road, or like what technique, I wish I would have known, or would have known, like you know, it's kind of a you just keep going, like oh. yeah. Well, see, but that's the thing. I wouldn't want to. That's where like I wouldn't want to go back and and change. Like I don't know how to put it. Like I wouldn't go back and like tell myself like man learn how to you know hit Baron Bolo back takes because it's going to be popular it's going to be popular Lake Lock's going to be popular right or or just, yeah because I feel like there was again there's things that I had to learn along the way there's a lot of fucking um, you know beatings I had to take because man I could go back and say like dude here's how you escape mount for real right and I'm still working on it but it's like this is you know it, this is all the lessons that I've learned over seven years I'm going to come back and I'm going to teach them to you today like that's one of those things that like I don't know if I would quite be the same jujitsu player today if I hadn't gone through the process of learning yeah, those you lessons. Wouldn't be, yeah, I mean, yeah, if, if you turned up and could give yourself a pill to be a great at jujitsu, it's not going to be the same. It's yeah, jiu- it's not going to turn out the same jujitsu. Yeah, it's because you didn't have to take the beatings right. all the way and the lessons. Like it's not. It's you go different. back and you, yeah, you change. You can't change the past too much. Nope. Like that's the thing that we've all learned from all the time travel movies. Yep. Can't, is you can't, can't change, change the past. past too much. A little bit, little little tweaks, but if you get real fucking bold with it, you're gonna change the future. That's right. Next thing you know, Biff is gonna be running things. Or Google. Oh, you haven't seen Hot Tub Time Machine yet. No. You gotta watch it. Uh-huh. The guy goes, one, Lou, one of the characters in the movie. I'll sum it up. They time travel. All his friends go back to the present. He stays back in the past, and he one of the things he changes is he comes up with Google. He mm. changes it to Google. Oh my god! <laughs> so when they all finally meet back up in the future, when he gets to their their same time frame, <laughs> it's not Google anymore. It's fucking Google. That's you know. funny. But anyways, okay. Uh, okay, so um, man, we're I don't need to beat up on the take really good notes. We've talked about that before. Yeah, that's how it's been. Start with taking notes, motherfuckers, take, if yeah, you're not taking notes. them. But yeah, take good notes. I mean, like I said, I wasn't super... What would be your definition? Like, what, like, what would you... Well, how would I change? I would uh, start... When I say taking really good notes, it's just more coming from uh, 
knowing nowadays how I learn jujitsu, you know, like my learning, my learning style was, was speaks to me when it comes to learning new techniques and con- concepts. Now having that information, it would help me to take better notes. Yeah. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Instead of just writing down, you know, the name of a move, step one, two, and three, you know, like. That's still how I would do it, but I would, I would have a little diff- different twist on it. You know, and start teaching myself um, in my note-taking for routes. You know, like we talked about before, choosing yeah. routes and, and roadmaps. Start that earlier on to help my understanding. Yeah. Instead, instead of it just being a whole collection of moves, that, you know, just trying to be a move library. Yeah. And then being able to try to access those moves as you're training. I think that's that's what I mean by that. Okay. So. No, I think that's good. Fair enough. But uh, next one I got... Um, they kind of all fall in the same frame, but uh, you know, don't take yourself too seriously, you know. And it kind of falls into remember why you're doing it. Make sure you're training jujitsu for the right reasons. Yeah. Because I, I would, like I've said before, is you know, moderation isn't one of my strongest suits. And so you know, and we've talked about this before. You know, when you first get started in jujitsu, it's really easy to get obsessed. You know, if you like it. And I did that to a fault, you know, just like alienated a bunch of other shit in my life. And didn't, I mean, I'd go back and tell myself like, yeah, you can be good at jujitsu, you can train real hard, but let's be realistic. You ain't going to be a fucking world champ. You know yeah. what I mean? Like you got started at 25 with no really wrestling background. You're a hobbyist. Respect that. Have fun with it. Try to be the best you can. But come on. You know, yeah. Like be realistic. Yeah, try to learn that balance thing a little sooner. Try to learn that balance a little sooner. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I I definitely... Because I I went through a lot of struggles with that, man, coming up. You know, and that's why I have... Really, when I look at that, like, those those four kind of all tie in. Because then my next two are, like, learn to be present and prioritize your time. Like, they're all kind of under that same umbrella. Because, dude, I remember really struggling with that. Like, whenever... I wasn't training jiu-jitsu. I'd be worried about training jiu-jitsu. Like, when's the next time I'm training? I need to get on the mat. I need to get on the mat. Oh, every time I'd have to go do something that wasn't jiu-jitsu, I'd be like, ah, fuck this. <laughs> you know, I'm not, right. not getting better at arm bars. Why do I got to go out to dinner? This is fucking stupid. You know, like, just shit like that. And then, but then, being that I, it kind of had a negative spin on it, then when I'd get to jiu-jitsu and train, I'd be worried about the shit I needed to do after jiu-jitsu or what mm. I was missing to get there. You know, I was yeah. never fucking present. I didn't do, a, I wasn't really big into you know, training my mindset and thinking about that kind of stuff back then. I just wanted to fucking strangle people. Yeah. And so I think that, yeah, that wraps up like those four. Like I really, if I would have been more present and more intelligent with those things, I think it would have made my life significantly easier. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I'm sure it would have ended up in the same spot maybe. Yeah. yeah but you never know. Never but know. Those are some hard lessons that I had to learn just cause I, I would just get so bored. Right. And all I could see was forward. Yeah, yeah. No, I I can uh, I can see that. I can appreciate that. Yeah. I'm uh, yeah, man. I'm lucky. I'm married to a good woman. She's tolerated a lot of obsessive <laughs> bullshit from me. I mean, I've had both jujitsu and mountain biking. I've I've done that and had to catch myself. Like, dude, you are really you know if you're a single dude, it's one thing. And, but if you got friends, you got family, you got other people in your life. Uh, thing. Yeah, you gotta. Yeah, yeah, because they're there for the long term, and I, I guess probably that that's the thing is like it's not just you that has to, you know, like the people around you. You got to keep in mind like this is a long term thing, and so it's not a sprint; it's a marathon. And if you fucking wear people out with a sprint mentality early on, they may not be there for you at, at the, the end of the marathon. marathon. That is true. That's a really good way to put it. So yeah, and that's but it is tough, man, because it is. I I, t- I still remember. It's like, man, I was so afraid that if I missed the class, it was going to be the technique <laughs> that gonna I needed. They were going to answer jiu-jitsu today. You know, it was going to be like, yeah, I, I didn't think like a dim mock move or something, <laughs> but I just meant like, you know, they're, they're gonna, they're, there's going to be the technique that I'm going to be like, oh, wow, okay, that's going to, I keep getting stuck in this position, and now I'm going to know how to get out of it, or, or you know, the, the, they're going to show me how to solve a problem or something. And so I was so <laughs> scared to miss a class because it was like, man, I'm going to miss what I need to know to be better at jiu-jitsu. And so, yeah, that was, God, dude, when I, when I first started, I was a ton of time on the mats. But then I had that, I remember, like, 
man, when we opened Grand Valley, I was there a bunch too. So mm-hmm. I was like helping run the kids class and I was there helping with classes a bunch. And, uh, yeah, I remember realizing one day, I'm like, dude, I am spending way too much time there. I've got to dial this back. Uh, I got to have somewhat of a healthy balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before the people around me start, um, not being around and suffering for it or, you know, yeah, being noticeable. So yeah, it's a tough lesson, but yeah, the people around you keep them in mind because you want them around at the end as well. So being really fit and good at arm bars. Yeah, it's cool. But, uh, yeah, it's only cool for so far and so there's far. To, yeah, there's more to life, life man. Life to That's the hard thing to tell 25 year old, 24 year old self. But, <laughs> dude, there is. is more to life, brother. Fuck that. There's, there's not more, any more to It's life. hard to tell. Yeah. So, Lying to me. yeah. No, man, I think those are all, all good things here. That's uh, all. That's almost all mine. The last one I had was just, uh, be glad I didn't quit because of all yeah. the roadblocks I had to run into. Dude, even like, so when I first started training, the first school I was training at, my instructor was renting mat space from a Taekwondo lady. So we'd have to wait until the fucking Taekwondo class was over every night, which sometimes wasn't like until 7 or 8 o'clock at night a lot of times. And it's a tiny ass place. And dude, that was like a fucking half hour or 45 minute drive from my house. No exaggeration. That was the, and that was the only jiu-jitsu school near me. And so I, you know, so you would train until... 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night, then I'd have a fucking 45 minute drive home and then I gotta be back to work at 6 a.m., 7 a.m. And I was doing that shit regularly and I kept at it. And then when that mat space fell through just because, you know, she wasn't renting to us or something anymore, he moved the outfit down to where we got access to a wrestling room, one of the local, like, junior highs let us rent the wrestling room out. Yeah. And that was still, you know, another half hour, 45 minute drive. Like, there was nothing close to me the whole time. Mm-hmm. And then, I ended one of our training partners broke off and opened up another school, but that was still another half hour in the other direction. So no matter where I went, like I was putting in not only the training time, but the fucking travel time. Yeah. Just running myself into the ground. And then I fell into the same, but I kept at it. Like there would have been reason to quit for most people, I think. Like, yeah, yeah dude. Like you gotta be pretty dedicated to this hobby to be, you know, putting in that time yeah. after working a fucking was driving. 12 hour day and yeah. still putting in the time. And then when I moved out here, I've told that story before. I moved out here, I didn't have a coach. You know, that I ran into, ah, dude, I got super frustrated during that time in my jiu-jitsu, but I fucking kept at it. You know, kept driving to Denver, kept doing, finding training partners and blah, blah, blah. And, yeah, I just, I enjoyed it so much that I just, I knew I had to keep doing it. I knew it was an important part of my life. And at that time, I didn't really understand why it was so important, but something told me it was, so I just kept at it. Yeah. And I enjoyed it. You know, looking back, I can rationalize a little bit more, but it's still, it is really surprising that I kept with it. Through all the fucking hurdles I had to jump to keep training. Most people would have aborted the hobby. They would have been like, eh, I'll find something I can do that's easier and closer. Yeah. 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 No, man, that's true. I mean, people have trouble making a 10-minute drive. Yeah. It's like, live 10 minutes away. And it's yeah. like, man, where you been? Oh, I've been busy. I've been busy. It's like, dude, come on. So. Yeah, well, fucking, that's why I just, sometimes I get super frustrated with people. Yeah. It is. I mean, yeah, when you see the... Um, yeah, the sacrifices. I mean, I, I, yeah, I told you before, man. I'm, I'm glad you stuck with it. I'm impressed. I don't know that I would have stuck with, with it. I probably, I like to think that I would have, but, uh, yeah, that's that was a fucking it's tough, a grind, dude. It was not easy. Tough grind. So, yeah, I had some. You know, when I moved to Texas for mountain biking, I was like. <laughs> I've seen the crazy shit you built Jesus, in your backyard. Dude. Yeah, I'd put some keep, effort out to keep that going. <laughs> to keep that ride. It's kind of the same idea. Yeah. The same mindset. Yeah. You put a lot of time into building all that a shit out of that time. backyard. It's just, yeah, I had no choice. We had like one trail system around there. And so like if I wanted to go ride, it was a it was a big deal. And yeah, it's, uh, so yeah, when you find something that you like, that's the thing, it's, like, what else, it, it becomes part of you. Mm-hmm. And it's not just a hobby or yeah, it's, it's just it's what I do, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like no, you're. It's like you don't do jujitsu. Like you're a jujitsu. We've talked about this before. I don't know what you call jujitsu people. Like you know, a mountain biker. Like I didn't. I didn't just ride a mountain bike. I, I was a mountain biker. You're, and there is a fucking difference. You're a jujitsuer. Yeah, exactly. Like we're and there is a difference between people that just do it and people that really live it. And if you're living it, it's like yeah, it gets becomes part of your your DNA so you don't really it it's 
like you, the world you, the, you're looking at the world in a way that it's like you have no other choice it's like well duh that's the only self-evident choice to make because if I don't do that like that's it's not even an option yeah, it's not, it's even, not an even an option. option not an option yeah yeah like that's the funny thing is it's not like because I know I, I'm just I'm assuming um, just thinking back to some of my experiences with with things that it, you're it's not like you're sitting there thinking like well I could quit but I decided not to. It was like no, was... the option to quit never even fucking entered the mind, man. It just wasn't there. Like maybe it was a fleeting like, but yeah, it wasn't... yeah. You know, I mean, you would you would ask yourself sometimes like, why am I doing this? Yeah. But you, it wasn't like a completely nagging question all the time. No, no, you weren't sitting there yeah, mulling you, it over. You would for say, days. why am I doing this? God, I'm an idiot. Yeah, but I love it. You yeah, know yeah, it yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I'm okay with being an idiot. Yeah, this, this exactly, respect, man. So I know. Yeah, when I was. Right into the hospital with a severed urethra. <laughs> severed urethra. Oh, fuck. Like, I was really... Every time you say that. That was, that, was close, that was the hardest I thought about quitting mountain biking. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was... That, that lasted about a day or two. Mm-hmm. I was fucking walking around with a catheter tube man, healing up already thinking like, all right, I gotta get back on the bike. <laughs> gotta, <laughs> fight, gotta get one can of I those ride, saddles. Can I ride with this catheter tube? Can no. I hook it up to my camel pack? How can I do this? Dude, when I had uh, surgery on my thumb, <laughs> I've told you this before, I had a cast on and I, I figured out that I could I could use the cast and, and rest it just so on my handlebar and grab and, and it was my left hand and my right hand is the one that you switch gears with and stuff and I could, I could use the brake. So... I figured out how to ride my bike with a fucking cast on, you know. I'm, That's I'm intelligent. Oh, dude, no, yeah, it's but again, man. I look back, I love that dude. That guy was a madman. Mm-hmm. He was an idiot. But he was a madman. I'm literally trying to ride downhill in Waimea Canyon with a fucking cast on. <laughs> but yeah, it was awesome, man. That's just it. Just wasn't an option. It was never an option. It was like, oh, snap a tendon in my thumb, get it fixed. It's like quit mountain biking. What the fuck are you talking about? And I remember my dad would talk to me like. Have you ever think quitting, you know, getting hurt? It's like, no, no. The thought just doesn't even enter my yes, mind. I, you know, I had to go up to work, you know, a few days ago or whatever it was, and uh, walk into the office. You know, a bunch of office ladies in there, and I got my brace on my knee, and you know, this isn't the first time one of them like, oh, you're probably gonna have to give up your fighting, huh? And I just laugh at. It. I'm like, nope, nope. No, I, I will plop myself out of a fucking wheelchair. And start and slap hands and wrestle. That's right. Like, there ain't no fucking quit. What are you talking about? Yeah. Let's get out of here. It's not an option, not man. Not an option. Yeah, but people live, you know, it's all right to quit things. But that's how you know, man. I think that's how you know. Like, if the, if the option's even there, like, I don't know. Maybe it's just not the same thing. Like, when you find, when you find that thing. Yeah, when you find that thing, it's, it's not an even ever a thought process. Yeah. It's not, it's not there. Like, no. Or if you can't find that thing, maybe you're just a quitter. So that, that's kind of the balance, man. <laughs> that's the thing. Like sometimes you hear that thing, right? It's the old, uh, you know, oh, the, the the story about the dude that stopped mining and he was like six inches away from gold or whatever it was, right? And so the, the, the meaning is, is keep going, keep going, keep going. But man, there's a lot of those motherfuckers that kept mining and they just died. They never hit gold. And so like you do need to decide. You do need to like, it's uh, what Dan John pointed that out that uh, in his writings, like the Latin root word for decide is to cut off. And so that's the thing, man. You just got to, you got to be able to decide and cut things off. And so sometimes, but that's the hard thing. Are you being a little bitch or are you like you're really, smart are you really making a smart decision so that you can move in another direction? Because that's the other thing too, is you can only say yes to so many things. You, you can't say yes to everything. So if you're saying yes to this, you're saying no to something else. So it, uh, anyways, anyways, that's part of fucking life. So, so that's all mine, man. Man, yeah, mine were the competing gets less scary. I, I mean, I've talked about this. Like that was the my first competition was that's the scariest thing I ever did. Uh, like I just my brain, my lizard brain was like, run, bitch, Fire. run, get out of here. And uh, I was real lucky because again, coming from the mountain biking and, and especially like the extreme side of it, like you do learn. And I'm sure same thing with you with like snowboarding, man. Like you do learn how to like quiet that thing. You may be screaming in your ear, but you still gotta. Still got to execute, and so I was. I was glad I had that man. I'm like, I couldn't even imagine being a dude in my late 30s, stepping on a mat as a white belt for the first time, not having really done anything competitive or like kind of like high, super high stress level where you still have to maintain focus. And uh, yeah, that was fucking. Yeah, it would be brutal to. Yeah, you, you, I guess you forget about that to get to that age. 
and and never have any haven't put yourself in that mindset before you know that high stress anxiety and just to have to deal with that yeah Ooh. yeah I can't, I can't imagine getting to that age and then having to deal with it yeah that's yeah. gonna be pretty pretty tough it is tough man but you know just i guess uh again looking back like i i don't know i don't know what i expected but uh, I look back at like my last competition and just the difference uh, between that first one and, and this last one. And again, I'm nervous and stuff, but it was just it was just another day at the office, man. I'm doing jujitsu. It's just a little more higher stress situation than most, but uh, it's just jujitsu. And so, uh, but yeah, that would have been nice to know back then. <laughs> Like, hey, man, this is going to get easier. It'll be all right. This is, it'll be all right. Because I'm sitting here thinking, like, Jesus Christ, I'm never going to do this again. <laughs> Why do I do this to What myself? was that about? <laughs> so, um, yeah. But, comp- I mean, we've talked about, though, competition is important. I think that everybody needs to compete. You don't need to be a competitor. But competing definitely helps your jiu-jitsu and helps you deal with those high-stress situations. So, um, yeah. Very beneficial. Yeah, it's super beneficial. Uh, the drilling, given yeah, we had a whole episode on drilling, yep. um, we didn't really do, we didn't do drilling at, uh, at, at, uh, Gracie Baja at all. I don't, I don't seem to remember doing any drilling there. Um, and then what was funny is we kind of backed into our drill class. Like it wasn't a drill class. It was supposed to be a regular class. You turned it into, that's right. I you turned it into a class. drill class because you were fucking sick of teaching. That's right. I wanted to train, you know. My, I, I only get in there, you know, when I was busy. At, dude, at the time, I think I was still working at Halliburton. And so I knew when I came in, like, that was my time to train. I, my yeah. training days were very limited. And for me to have to come in and fucking teach a goddamn beginner's class, like, man, I need to train. Like, yeah. I'm on the mat a couple days a week at that point. And I was like, well, because I remember it started from, like, positional sparring. I wanted to do positional sparring day. And then just kind of more, then we did like drill, we did that a couple times, then we did a drill day, and everybody seemed like the drill day, and it just kind of it stuck. Yeah, uh, yeah, we backed into that, yeah. so it wasn't even on purpose. Nope. And, but yeah, next thing That's you know. That's been going almost ever since fucking Grand Valley's been open. Pretty much, out. man. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was, like I said, it was funny how it happened, but that'd be one thing I wish I could have go back and tell my white belt self, like, look, dude, drilling, you know embrace it get into it sooner i think that's one thing that uh would have been beneficial to appreciate kind of like the mobility and recovery if i would appreciated the value of drilling sooner um it just would have helped my jiu-jitsu um so yeah but i mean we're both big fans and and again but drilling the right way it's not just going through the moves right you're trying to really think about what you're doing there's a way to learn Mm -hmm. and and if you don't know how to learn there's a good book the art of learning uh by josh whiteskin Uh, whiteskin whiteskin yeah and, um, it, it, but, uh, yeah, it's like when you hear like Kit Dale, he's, he's the guy that says like drilling sucks yeah. or doesn't work. What he's basically saying is like the mindless drilling that most people do doesn't work. So if you do it right, drilling is fucking super valuable. If you do it wrong, it can be a waste of time. You can even ingrain bad habits. Um, so make sure you do it right. Go back and listen to the previous episode if you need some tips. Like that fucking, yeah, boy. <laughs> um... The last one I got is uh, Nogi, man. That uh, that you'll like Nogi. I think it's kind of like the, the competition thing. I don't know that my white belt self would have believed it. but Because, man, the gi was the only thing fucking saving my ass as a white belt. Those grips are awesome. And especially, yeah, you got like fucking Nick Henney fucking coming at me. And, and uh little fucking wrestler dude and I'm like dude I can grab this gi slow him right down slow him right down this is awesome it's like I don't want to do no gi it's going into wrestler's world <laughs> that's what it seemed to me you know like no gi was wrestling and if somebody had a wrestling background that they were just gonna like they in were in trouble that was in big trouble cause I had no I had no clue how to really operate in that world and uh so yeah we didn't really do I don't think Gracie Baja did much no gi they didn't and so, you know, it just wasn't something I had much exposure to. And uh, I didn't enter any competitions. I didn't really, yeah, I didn't really embrace it. It was kind of, again, something I backed into. It's funny, it's funny. that's because, you know, you started at GP. Yeah, you know, it's because when I remember when I first came in, they're like, my coach never really uh, differentiated between uh, gi jiu-jitsu and no gi jiu-jitsu. It was just fucking jiu-jitsu. Yeah. We spent a lot of time training without the gi. We spent a lot of time training in the gi. Like, it was, it was... It was jiu-jitsu. So mm-hmm. all coming up for me, like, I never separated it. 
I mean, obviously there's technique techniques that work better in one than the other. Right. It was still just fucking jujitsu. Yeah. Like, I never had that really separation in my mind. Like, and your game should work good either way. Yeah. Maybe you got some go tos with gi, I know gi, you know. And well, see, I think like, God had you as an early influence, man, because I remember you telling me that super early on. I remember you would come in and you would coach. You'd come in on the weekends and coach because yeah. you could wear your fucking non GB gi <laughs> and not get harassed. And uh, man, I still remember you saying that, like, you know, just because you got a gi doesn't mean you got to use it, and that you know your 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 jujitsu should transfer pretty seamlessly back and forth. So. And that stuck in my mind, and so I really uh, um, made a you know effort to do that. Dude, I remember I, a while back, a few couple years ago, I just made one of those stupid rules for myself that I wasn't going to use grips. That that was kind of the start of it. I stopped mm-hmm. using grips in the gi. I remember you doing that. Yeah, because I was really over relying on them. my rig and mortise guard was just getting out of hand, and so uh, yeah, I was like, okay, I'm not grabbing it at all, and I, I think that's what. Kind of, huh? That's interesting. That is about when like nogi started getting super fun for me. So, but yeah, I love nogi now. I mean, I tell you all the time. I'm like, I hate that fucking gi. And you were even saying that last time you had a gi on. Damn, like, dude. This fuck this thing, dude. One of you motherfuckers gets a collar grip, and I just feel like a dog on a leash. And it's like I'm just getting led outside behind the woodshed to get spanked. <laughs> You know, you spank your dog behind the woodshed. Right? It's like, well, you do when you give him a beating, you don't want other people to see. <laughs> and that's what, I, Poor that's what I feel like sometimes. I'm not saying that I do to my dog. I'm saying I feel like that dog sometimes. But, you know, and then, oh, well, break their grip. Motherfucker, you try to break a black belt's grip. It is hard as shit. Like, you got to abort mission on almost everything else to break a grip. grip. Like, that's why, like, dude, Randy's, like, it's so hard to deal with his grips because he's so fucking strong. And you divert your attention to get that grip off, and then it's yeah. like, boom. Yeah. And so, anyways, I understand theoretically, and I'm a purple belt, and I'm moving up in the world, so I'm, I'm working on that. But, yeah, man, I love just getting in there without the grips. And it's like, you know, hey, man, let's just play jiu-jitsu. Fuck your grips. <laughs> <laughs> grips but, are jiu-jitsu. I know, they are. And I, I like the gi, man. I, trust me, I do. But there's just times when people are grabbing my collar. I'm like, I am so sick of this fucking collar. Like, I just want to play jujitsu. That's the thing, too. You know, you get stalled out. Like, it, gi jujitsu, it's fun, but it's different. It's different. It is totally different. Like, you can spend a lot of time just in the same basic positions because of your, the, the grips that you're dealing with. Somebody gets a lapel wrapped around your leg, and you get some fucking weird lapel guard going on. And now you got to deal with all this shit before I can start before you can move. fucking passing your guard and fucking killing you. It just frustrates me. It's like I just want to, I just want to get to the good stuff, man. I just want to get to the good stuff. So, anyways, but yeah, now I like it. Now I like Nogi, but I wouldn't have believed it when I was uh, coming up. When I was coming up, man. So it's all good shit. It's good. Is that it? That's it, man. That was my. Li- oh, Rob's not as scary as he pretends. So yeah, yeah. I still don't like you putting out the stuff. <laughs> Don't be fucking telling people these lies, James. Nah. Well, it was funny, dude. You and I hit it off pretty early. I mean, we weren't quite like, you know, best friends like we are now, but the, um, I remember we drilled when Lance came to town. Mm-hmm. We, uh, you, you know, we got together as drilling partners and I remember you like complimenting me and saying like, Hey man, thanks for, you know, taking drilling seriously. I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I just remember like you and I kind of always hit it off or not. I don't know. Like. I don't know if hit it off. We didn't hit it off right away because you wouldn't hit it off with anyone because you were fucking scary, angry, purple belt Rob. But I felt like we were, um, I don't know. I realized you weren't an idiot. I don't know how to put it. I didn't, I didn't quite, I, I could see through, I could see why I was like, okay, Rob's like me. He just thinks everybody's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> He's tired of dealing with idiots. So, you know, and then, yeah, he saw that I wasn't an idiot. But, uh, it is funny, dude. I remember, like, you'll always be Purple Belt Rob in my mind. That's too funny. Like, fucking, yeah, showing up in that lucky gi, and you're just like, fuck this shit. And, yeah, it was, uh... Fucking GB. I won't even go on an anti gi Just leave it there. But, uh... Um, that was another roadblock I had to fucking deal with in my keep training. Yeah. So I'm gonna train at fucking GB. Yeah. And I saw that as a roadblock in my jiu-jitsu career. 
You I know, was, I was had the fucking like Steven Seagal it by me, man. And yeah, redirected the Aikido way. And it was a cocoon. Keep moving on. It was, the Jiu Jitsu was in a cocoon phase, and it was necessary Blossoms. for it to blossom out. But uh, yeah, it was funny, man. I remember everybody was like, "Fucking Rob, don't talk to Rob." <laughs> He's all grumpy. That's fucking hilarious. Like, I don't think he's grumpy. He just thinks you're all a bunch of idiots. <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> no, no, there might not. There might not be a difference there. There might be tomato, tomato. Yeah. No, when you're, when you're not dealing with idiots, you're not a grumpy guy. True. So. Very true. There you go. All right, we'll leave it at that. All right, we'll leave it at that. So. All right. Cool. Yeah. Until next week. Until next week, we'll uh, see you guys later. See you guys later. See you. Thank you for listening to the Grumpy Guy BJJ Podcast. Thank you all for listening. You can find us on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Please make sure to subscribe and leave us a review. It really does help and will allow us to keep putting out episodes. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas, hit us up at grumpyguybjj at gmail.com. Also, go to our website, grumpyguybjj.com, and get signed up for podcast updates and get our free BJJ Improvement Starter Kit. That's it for now, so get on the mat, train hard, and talk to you all next week. Your time's too, no clue, but soon a brief fun suit Might give you a view to choose Stay tuned, include, won't conclude To the end is near, beware there's consequences But what you do to me and demon The devil of many levels, I keep on feeding For several of them rebels Me, myself, and I Me, myself, and I